Good afternoon. Welcome to the Snap Revised um, YouTube live stream on uh, GCSE physics, speed and velocity. I'll just give it a moment um, for people to arrive. If you want to say hello in the chat, feel free. And if you have any questions as we go through, please pop them in the chat. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, but I'll hopefully get to your question whilst we're on the same slide and be able to answer it. So we're going to be talking about the GCSE content for speed and velocity. And I will just introduce myself first of all. So I'm David, um, I'm a GCSE physics teacher and have been for 16, 17 years now, specializing in physics um, up to A level. And um, I also do these uh, live tutorials and tutor as well. Um, and for Snap Revise, we're able to offer at the moment for the tutoring a free trial. So if you are interested in taking seven days without any commitment to pay or continue, then on the screen now you'll see there's a, a code you can enter at the checkout, which is Tutor Trial 7. Um, hi there, Khadija. Um, and if you go to the Snap Revise website, which I'll show you in just a moment, you can sign up there, set up yourself an account and um, select which courses you would like to take part in. Let's have a quick look at the Snap Revise website so you're familiar with where you can go. So that now should be in front of you. Um, if you go to snaprevise.co.uk, this is the homepage you'll uh, land on. And then if you click on sign up on the top right hand side, and then get started, I'm a student. Then you can sign in there with your details and you can use the code uh, tutor trial seven to give yourself seven days free trial. Um, you can choose which courses you want to uh, include yourself in. Um, they will involve four or more sessions a week, including live tutorials uh, with small groups of students where you'll get a chance to get um, independent individual help um, and also the advantage of being able to discuss and, and involve yourself and chat with other students who've got other questions as well. We also do live drop-in sessions which are a bit like a sort of a seminar if you're on a university course. Um, so for GCSE and A-level we will be available for at least an hour a week and we're there to answer your questions. So if you email in a question that's come to mind after one of our live streams or one of our uh, Zoom tutorials, then uh, we will always um, make sure we find example exam questions and our tutors um, will be able to go through additional support questions and clear up any further misunderstandings or problems you might have. Um, from the Snap Revise homepage, if you click on tutoring in the top in the middle there, there you can see the different courses that Snap Revise are offering. And if I click, for example, on GCSE Physics there, then you can see it'll come up with an example and also, importantly, a schedule. So if you scroll all the way down there near the bottom of the page, um, you can see the schedules for past months gone by and what's currently going on in June. And so for every subject, you can plan ahead, you can see what's coming up. Um, and uh, most of the content will be relevant to all GCSE students. Some of these sessions will be higher only. Um, some of them have a bit of higher content in, and we just point that out. Um, but the rest of the session is, is um, pertinent to students, um, no matter what level of entry. So that's the Snap Revise website, easy to navigate easy to sign up on. Um, you may as well get yourself a free trial as it's completely free for seven days. And if you have any friends who you want to encourage to get online and use our services, that would be really good. Right, let me get back to today's session on velocity and speed. Okay, hi Jazz. A playlist for GCSE maths. Um, I'll leave that to my colleague in the chat to take on as a comment to feed up. Um, possibly, might be something we can do. Um, okay, so sign up, use the code, get yourself seven days free. So for today's um, tutorial here on uh, YouTube, we're gonna be looking at the following objectives. We're looking at developing our understanding between the difference 
between speed and velocity. So looking at the difference between speed and velocity, let's change my pen to a pen, there we go, which are differently defined. And we need to be able to recall typical speeds for sort of everyday objects. And all the exam boards require us to be able to do that. We're going to be looking at calculating and measuring the speed and velocity of objects in motion and understanding how objects moving in a circle can have constant speed, but a changing velocity. And that's a higher level topic. We won't be covering in any detail centrifugal forces, centripetal forces, sorry, and we won't be covering motion graphs in this particular session. They are covered in individual tutorial sessions. So if you sign up for your seven day free trial, you can have a look back through previously recorded tutorials and you will find those there. So just a reminder, only higher students need to know about circular motion um, and centripetal forces is an edXL only topic. Um, and as I said, motion graphs are in a separate tutorial. Hi, Lena. OK, so I won't dwell for too long on the specifications. They're quite similar. AQA tend to be very detailed. Um, you need to be able to use the equation distance is speed times time. We'll just point something out. Um, that equation here on the AQA site is given as S equals VT. Um, the symbol S is often used for distance or displacement. Um, and sometimes it's easy to confuse that for speed. But here that means distance or displacement equals velocity times time or speed times time. Um, at Excel again, being able to use that equation, being able to describe a range of methods of determining the speeds of objects and recall some typical speeds encountered in everyday experience. And OCR is again, very much the same. Um, 2.2p here for OCR. This is higher only. Explain why an object moving in a circle with constant speed has changing velocity. So that's our circular motion reference there, which we'll come to later. So let's have a look first at uh, what we already know. Um, so thinking about distance um, and displacement, what are the differences between distance and displacement? Would anyone in chat like to um, give me their ideas there? What's the difference between distance and displacement? So the distance, um, I am, the distance that an object or a, um, a system moves is just the length of a journey. So it's um, just a length. Of a journey. And that journey could take a really circuitous path. It could be winding around different roads or you know, from A to B. Um, and it's the overall complete length of the journey that's been taken. Whereas displacement is a vector quantity. So distance is scalar. It has magnitude and no direction, but displacement is a vector. And they're the important differences between the two. Um, it's a vector from a start to an end point. <clears throat> and then time, of course, when we're looking at distance and speed and time, time is merely the, the complete time it's taken since for the since the, the end of the event. So from beginning to end of an event, how much time has passed during an event? And that event might be in the case of an exam question, uh, something accelerating from a standstill to 30 meters per second or decelerating from one value to another. Okay, do, do cut in the chat if you would like to ask any questions, I'll carry on. And if I get any questions as we go, I'll pause and answer those as we move through this. So part one then, calculating speed and velocity. So um, speed is how um, fast something is going. Um, so it's a rate of change of distance with time. So speed is the distance traveled per unit time.
Hi, Lena. In terms of exam questions, um, I'm going to come on to a few example questions later on. So um, we'll have a chat about those later and I'll talk about exam technique where I can. Um, there are so many questions that can be asked with uh, relating to distance speed and time and velocity. They're all of a certain type. There's not really much variation between them, but the context can be very different. So um, but the examples we'll give will, will I hope, help. Um, so speed, distance per unit time. Here we've got a nice Newtonian apple falling here. So as that apple is falling, time is passing. And over that time, there's a distance traveled. We measure from the top of the apple, from the top to the top of the apple at the bottom. There's our distance we could measure. And our speed would be that distance divided by the time taken. The velocity is similar, but very importantly, has a uh, direction included. So velocity is speed, um, but um, in a given direction. So for us to find the velocity, we must also give a direction. So if we knew the time that had passed for this apple to fall, and we knew the distance it had traveled, then we could do distance divided by time and find the speed but we wouldn't be giving a velocity unless we also said down in our answer. So um, some way of describing a direction needs to be included whenever you're stating a velocity. So on to calculating speed and velocity. Um, the unit of speed being distance divided by time is meters per second, usually written like I've just done so for GCSE. And later on at A-level, you'll probably more often see it written like this, meters times seconds to the minus one. But they mean exactly the same thing. So speed is the ratio between distance and time. So speed is distance divided by time. And usually we're measuring distances in meters, as SI units and time in seconds. And in terms of exam technique, be really careful when you're given questions on this topic, because quite often there'll be a scaling factor that you need to include. So you might be asked to find the speed of something in meters per second, but you might be given distances in centimeters or millimeters or kilometers, and times might be in minutes or hours as opposed to seconds. So there's often some conversions that you, you may need to do. So Speed is distance divided by time. Speed and velocity in terms of the calculation are the same thing. And distance is often uh, depicted by the symbol S or letter S for displacement. So S is distance or displacement, T is time. So there's our meters on top, there's our seconds on the bottom, giving us the unit meters per second. And the average speed of an object is just the total distance traveled divided by the time taken. And that doesn't take into any account any fluctuations or variations in the speed of the object during its journey. We just look at the total distance traveled divided by the total time taken. I'll add the word there in front there. So again, that's going to be in meters per second. Any questions, again, just pop them in the chat. Um, don't worry if there's a bit of a lag. If you need me to pop back to an earlier slide, I'm happy to do, happy to do that. Um, now, as I was saying about average speed, um, most realistic objects, they tend to fluctuate in speed as they're moving. And so this is why we, average speed is not taking any of that into account. It's just total distance divided by total time. Let's have a look at a couple of examples, calculating speed and velocity. Um, the first question we've got here, an Olympic sprinter runs at 9.8 metres per second. Calculate the time it would take them to run 80 metres. So we've got displacement is speed over time. Um, we want the time, so we need to rearrange that formula. And we're going to have time is equal to... Um, Displacement, sorry, sorry, one second. I've written the wrong equation down there. Which I should have written the V. Start again. So we're looking, sorry, we're looking at velocity is equal to displacement divided by time. 
And here we want to find the time. So we need to rearrange the equation. We get time is equal displacement divided by the velocity. So T is displacement over V. We've got the displacement, we've got the V. So the time is going to be 80 meters divided by 9.8, which if you pop into your calculator, you get the answer 8.2 seconds. Sometimes when you're calculating times, distances, speeds, or velocities, you get a number with a lot of decimal places. Watch out for questions which ask you to give an answer to maybe two significant figures and make sure that you do round your answer in the answer space correctly to make sure you don't lose a mark for incorrect rounding. Let's have a look at another example. Um, calculate the average speed of a car which takes two hours to drive 50 kilometers. So let's write the simple equation down again. Velocity is equal to displacement over time. And we need to find the average speed. So we're going to use displacement over time. Um, and this is one which is going to need some scaling done because we've got hours, not seconds, and we've got kilometers, not meters. So that's our S, the 50 kilometers. This is our time. So S is going to be 50 times 1,000 or 50 times 10 to the 3, if you like. And we're going to divide that by the time. And we want the time in seconds so that we can get a unit of meters per second out for our average speed. So that's going to be two hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. So 50,000 divided by two times 60 times 60. And that equals 6.8 meters per second when you pop that into your calculator. So question from Lena, um, does writing the equation give you a mark even if you get the answer incorrect? Sometimes it does, yes. Particularly when the question says, choose an equation from the physics equation sheet. So if you come across an exam question which is asking you to pick an equation to use, quite frequently there will be three or four marks for those kinds of question. Um, often you get a mark for selecting the right equation, and then you might get another mark for rearranging it correctly, particularly with, the, particularly with the equation for kinetic energy, for example, which is more tricky to rearrange, Ke is half mv squared. And you may well get a mark for substituting in the numbers in the correct places, and another mark, maybe a fourth mark for the right answer and maybe even another mark for the correct unit. So yeah, it does vary according to the question, um, but certainly if you're choosing formula and um, having to remember them or pick them from a sheet, there's a good chance you will be given credit for picking the right formula. And um, even if you write the right formula down and then make an error when you're rearranging it, there's a chance therefore you could get a mark just for writing it down to begin with. <coughs> OK, so um, all the exam boards require you to be able to recall typical speeds of simple everyday or everyday experienced objects and situations. So you don't need to know exact values for any of these. Um, you just need to suggest a speed and the values that you suggest need to be something near um, an accepted value. So, you know, walking, running and cycling speeds are obviously going to vary hugely between different people. Um, so younger, fitter people are going to go faster than older or unhealthy people and Olympic athletes are going to be moving much quicker. So, um, yeah, Usain Bolt was traveling around 10 meters per second when he set the 100 meter world record. So that's a lot faster than the average person uh, walking or running. Um, and the distance you're traveling also affects your speed. If you're running a long distance, then your average speed is going to be a lot lower. Whereas if you're running a very short distance, your average speed will be a lot higher because you don't have to sustain that energy um, output for so long. Um, and there'll be fluctuations in all of these speeds. Um, sprinters take a second or so to get up to full speed. Long distance runners will speed up near the end of a race to use up um, the remaining energy and get the most out of their training. And vehicles, of course, also have fluctuations in speeds, changing speed limits for cars, trains slowing down for bends and so on. So we just want a rough idea of typical speeds of these everyday situations. So for somebody walking, a good number to consider is about 1.5 metres per second. So not very fast. A gentle walk is about one and a half metres per second. Now, the average person running or jogging might just be twice as quick as that. So um, three metres per second is quite acceptable for someone who's running. Like I said, we're not talking Usain Bolt here. We're not thinking of someone who's running at 10 metres per second because that's quite unusual. And then we got someone cycling. Well, um, again, if you were cycling, you probably wouldn't generally cycle as fast as Usain Bolt. So we're going to just double the running speed. 
and say six meters per second. So these are quite easy to remember because we're doubling them each time. So walk, run, cycle, one and a half, three, six. So if you remember the walking and know to double it for the other two, that'll help you remember those rough numbers. Um, if you don't, just have a sensible think um, and make a, a scientific estimate in an exam. They will give you a margin here, so you don't have to give exactly these answers. Um, a car traveling, say, uh, on a motorway might be traveling at 30 meters per second, so considerably quicker. And um, the train could travel twice as quickly as that, maybe an intercity train, 140 meters per second, sorry, miles an hour, perhaps. So um, closer to 60 meters per second, unless it's a Japanese bullet train, and it might be going considerably faster than that. Um, and then an aircraft, um, maybe 200 meters per second. So these are approximate values which are sensible um, and typical estimates for the speeds of these different objects. So how are we all feeling about what we covered so far? We've done the speed equation. Uh, so velocity or average speed is distance over time. And um, we've had a look at some typical velocities and done a few examples. Um, those in the chat, if you can give me some ones, twos or threes, I'd be really grateful just to give me an idea of how secure you are in what we've covered so far. And if you've got any questions, then now's a good time to ask them and I can um, recap anything you'd like me to. Thank you, Arvin. So Arvin's on two, so he's all right with that. That's good. Do rerun this at any point if you'd like to. Um, you can uh, rewatch these streams. Um, great. Thank you, Lena. Um, it's it's designed to be friendly. I mean, this, this it's not too tough, but it doesn't help you when you get told that this is easy, really. Um, but when you've been exposed to these type, kinds of questions for, uh, you know, for long enough and you've done lots of practice, you will find they get easier and easier. So it's just intended as a recap to help you set back in. OK, let's move on to another example question then. So this one is an Excel question from the foundation paper, and this is quite an old one. Um, like I said earlier, the exam questions don't vary hugely. Um, so although it's just from the old spec, it's still something you could have come up. So some students investigate the speed of cars. They measure the time it takes each car to travel a distance of 80 metres. And the table shows some of their results. So I tend to advise students to underline or highlight things in questions to help them think about them. And the first thing I'm noticing is that the distance travel column is all the same. And it says it in words at the top here. They're all traveling 80 meters, which is important. First part of this question, just for one mark, is state the color of the slowest car. So we're looking for one that took the longest time. Now, they're all going the same distance, so we don't have to do a calculation here. We don't have to um, do anything other than look for the biggest number in time here, and that's 5.6. So the answer to the first part of the question will be the white car is the slowest. It took the longest time to cover 80 metres. The second part of the question for two marks is going to require you to do a bit more and it needs a calculation. Calculate the speed of the black car. So we're looking at the second row from the bottom of the table. I'm going to write down the equation. So average speed or velocity is equal to displacement or distance divided by time. That's exactly what we're going to use. Um, the displacement is 80 metres and the time is 4.3 seconds the units in there as well, putting the units in because then you can always see what the units is going to be for your answer. It's going to be metres per second. You can always calculate units, even if you can't remember, by looking at what calculation you've done. And when you pop those numbers in the calculator, you should get out 18.6 metres per second. So that's a nice um, straightforward question for three marks. Let's have a look at another one, slightly trickier this one. Exam boards sometimes throw you some information that's not needed. Or another favourite is to give you quite a lot of information at the beginning of a question and then continue that question over two pages, by which time you forget to go and look back at the beginning of the question. So in terms of exam technique, make sure you look very carefully at the information you're being given and don't get fooled into using something you don't need and don't forget things that you've been told early on. So here we've got a ping pong ball being dropped onto a sloping surface. Here's a diagram of what's going on. The ball bounces and the horizontal distance it travels is measured. So we're not measuring anything about the drop um, at this point. We're just measuring the horizontal distance here. Um, the ball dropping from 70 centimetres, 
So dropping took 0.6 seconds to travel a horizontal distance of 30. Oh, hang on, then we've got to think about this. To travel a horizontal distance of 34 centimeters. So actually, the fact that it's been dropped is irrelevant. It was dropped from 70 centimeters, but it took 0.6 seconds to travel a horizontal distance of 34 centimeters. So that is the time taken for it to travel this horizontal distance. And we've got to calculate the horizontal velocity of the ping pong ball. So this is a red herring, this 70 centimeters thing, we do not need. And this, in this question gives us the formula to use, which is nice and friendly as well. Um, from um, speed equals displacement over time, they've rearranged it for us to give us displacement is equal um, to velocity times time. But they've stated that equation here for us. So we've got to show the working and give the unit four marks. So the first mark you're going to get for putting the correct numbers into our formula. Um, the displacement is 0 0.34. Um, we want the horizontal velocity, so we're going to need to rearrange it. So we're going to go back to our original formula. They've actually given our formula in the wrong form, haven't they? We need to use V equals S over T. So it's going to be 0 0.34, um, which is 34 centimetres in metres. We're going to divide that by the time, which is 0 0.6 seconds. So that's the calculation we need to do. So actually, by giving us the formula in the wrong form and asking us to rearrange it, that's an excuse to give us a mark. So we get a mark for giving us for doing that. We get a mark for substituting in the right numbers. And then we'll get another mark for writing down the answer, which is 0 0.57. Um, I'll leave the unit for a second. That's, that's our third mark. And then the unit meters per second, that's going to be our fourth mark. One, well, one, two, three, four. So that's a really nice question. It's quite late on in the paper. And I think I'm trying to just catch students out here with that bit of information that's thrown in without any need. Um, it's question 11 from an OCR paper. Um, and this is a new spec OCR paper. It is a foundation paper. Uh, and you do need to read that question really carefully. Um, otherwise, you could easily take the wrong distance here. It's more of a reading comprehension level question than it is a straightforward science question. OK, so move on. We'll move on now to measuring speed and circular motion. So quite often in an exam, you'll be given an example like uh, Susie and Gary set up an experiment to measure the speed of a marble being dropped from a retort stand in the lab, something like that. And you might be asked to describe how could you um, use light gates, for instance, to measure the speed of the, the ball being dropped or the, or the piece of card moving through the light gates. So you need to have an understanding of how um, some data logging equipment works. And hopefully you will have had some time to see or experience for yourself data logging equipment in the lab. But a light gate works by when an object passes through the gates of the light gate, so passes through the um, light beam from one side to another, um, the light beam gets cut. So when an object passes through the light gate, the light beam gets cut just momentarily that light beam gets cut and, and that could be set up in your data logger as a trigger point to begin logging time so that means that a sensor is triggered to log oops it's tongue for some reason so a sensor is triggered to log time and that could be the time for a piece of card of a known length to go through the light gate, triggering it and then allowing the light beam to pass again. And that could be used if you know the length of the card, you know a distance, you know a displacement and the time it takes. You could get the, uh, the, the data logger to calculate a, a speed directly from that. Or it could just be a very short trigger to start something and another short trigger to stop it. Now, the advantage of light gates that do these two things, so triggered when an object passes through the beam and um, measure time or begin to measure time once that's happened. There'll be some end event or end triggering to stop the measurement of time. What that does is it eliminates um, 
reaction time error. So that's the advantage of using light gates. It eliminates reaction time error. If you can imagine you were doing this experiment by hand and you had a stopwatch in your hand and you were visually watching something fall or move from one point to another, then there's gonna be a short delay between you noticing something happening and you pressing the stopwatch to start it or to finish it. And um, what quite a few students tend to do incorrectly is they say it reduces human error. Human error is too vague a term to be using in an examination paper. So it is a human error, but be really specific. It's a reaction time error. Well, you could say the error in starting and stopping the stopwatch. So long as you've said it clearly enough, so the examiner's clear, it's not just human error because you often will not get a mark for saying just human error. But using this system does eliminate systematic errors due to the errors in our reaction times. So light gates are useful for doing that. The computer can track the sensors. The computer can then produce a graph for you. Um, it can take very many measurements in a short space of time. It can do repeat measurements. It can do all sorts of things that make it easier to get accurate data, which a human being might find it hard to do as well. Um, so this particular question, um, could come up on any of the specifications. So the, the idea of having to describe how you could use light gates to measure uh, the average speed of an object moving from one point to another is something you could be asked in any of the specifications. It's one of the ones where you're describing experimental ways to uh, measure speed. Um, and in this case, we would know a distance between two light gates. I could add that as a point and then the light gate will be triggered by the object moving through the first, and then again, moving through the second. We know the distance and the computer's logged the time, so we can output an answer automatically. Another way that we can measure time is by using ticker tape. Um, these are ticker tapes down the bottom here. Now, loads of schools still have this equipment, and I always still use it when I can. And um, they're basically, it's paper tape with tiny dots printed on them. Now they're blank tapes when you start, but as the tape is pulled through the ticker machine, the ticker machine prints dots and it's plugged into the mains AC supply and it prints dots 50 times a second, which is the mains frequency. So we know that every dot on the ticker tape is a 50th of a second in time apart. And that means we can use the ticker tape to represent um, speed and velocity by considering the distances between the dots on the tape. So for ticker tape, dots um, are printed um, on paper tape um, at equal time intervals. Um, or you could say at a constant rate, same thing, at equal time intervals, usually a 50th of a second for ticker ticker tape in the lab. Um, as the tape moves, you'd attach it to your moving object, or you could be pulling the tape through at, and attempting to pull it through at a constant speed or, or accelerating it. Um, the tape moves as the dots are made. So the tape is pulled through the ticker machine and the tape moves as the dots are made. And um, we can get three or four different results in the case of the diagram we've got down the bottom here. So we can look at the positioning of the dots and we can decide um, how the object is moving. So um, the dot spacing describes the motion. Which one gives the more accurate time? Arvin's asked in the um, chat there. Um, certainly the light gates. The light gates would be a really good accurate way of timing and therefore calculating um, average speed of an object. Ticker tape though um, is still a kind of question that might come up. Um, again, it would be a contextual question. So they'd show you a diagram of a ticker tape printer and they'd explain that the tape's being pulled through it. And you just need to understand um, an idea of how the spacing of the dots representing time can give us an idea of the motion. So if I consider the first one here, the first tape, taking it from left to right, um, what kind of velocity or what kind of motion does that represent? We've got dots that are close together to begin with, 
and then getting further apart as time goes on. So is that object moving at constant speed? Is it slowing down or is it accelerating? And if you think about the fact that the time between each dot is the same, as time intervals repeat, the distance moving in that time has increased. So here for the first one, we have um, the motion of something which is accelerating. So that dot pattern shows acceleration. From left to right, the second one down shows approximately constant speed because the dots are equally spaced. So roughly the same distance in each time interval. So constant speed for that one. And then the third one down and the fourth one down, we can compare them to the other two. So the third one down shows a negative acceleration or a deceleration because from left to right, assuming we started on the left, those dots are getting closer together with time. So the tape must be moving slower with time to get those dots closer together. And the bottom one is constant speed again, but slower than the first. So I'm just gonna say slower constant speed there. To the last one. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, you can't predict obviously what the exam boards are going to ask you, but this would be a perfectly reasonable question because you should have an understanding of um, how that distance would change with, over time, over equal time intervals, depending on the speed of an object. And that's all ticker tape shows you. Okay, so yeah, we pull the tape through, the dots get printed out. The faster we go, the more spaced out the dots become. Um, every dot represents the same time interval. And so the distance between the dots is proportional to the speed of the tape. And that's how we can write down these four descriptions of the motion. How are we feeling now about that? I'll come back to some other speed measurements in just a minute. So far, are we finding that straightforward now? All right, are you getting a bit confused? Please tell me if you are, um, and uh, I'll come back and help you. So we've um, covered two experimental methods there of measuring speed using light gates or the older way, but still very valid of using ticker tape, and light gates would be the most, most accurate. Okay, let's have a look at some other speed measurements. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Arvin. Good. Um, the two is good. Um, we'll have some more practice questions in a minute. And I'd always urge you to have a look at the resources on the SNAP Revisor website and the exam boards themselves. Um, download past papers is one of the best ways of preparing for exams is just looking at past papers. Come back to these videos. Um, when you're looking at questions, if they bamboozle you at all, come back to one of our tutorials and, and go through that again and then come back to the question. And even if you end up repeating a few of the questions, it's, it's all good stuff because you're, you're, you're building that memory and that knowledge and you'll be able to more quickly come up with the right answers the more practice you get. Um, hi there, Evan. Right, let's look at other speed measurement methods here. Um, so you could be, I don't know, surveying the land, you could be um, a charter of a civil engineer or something, and um, you might be walking around with something called a trundle wheel. So a trundle wheel has a known circumference, usually about a metre. Um, so we have a trundle wheel, um, we know the circumference here, so um, that could be a metre, let's call it a metre. And you have a stopwatch. And you have a little click every time that wheel goes round once. And so as you're walking along, measuring a distance, you can measure distance or a speed. Um, you can walk along and just measure distance by counting the clicks of the trundle wheel. Um, you could measure the speed by counting the clicks, multiplying them by the circumference, which should be one. So counting the clicks and then dividing that by the time taken that it took you to walk between two points. So there's a way you could measure speed using a trundle wheel and a stopwatch. Good luck, Mohammed, in your mocks. I'm sure they'll go well. Um, second method we've got top right here. This is a GPS system. So global positioning systems, they use satellites and um, they receive signals from satellites. They don't generally send signals back. They just receive them. And every satellite in a global positioning system has its own signature. So the GPS picks up the signature. It has a database built into the GPS of what that signature means. So it knows which satellite it is and where it is in the sky at any time. 
And once you've got a minimum of three or four, minimum three satellites, you can triangulate the position of something on the planet. And a lot of GPS systems pick up, you know, 10, 11, 15 satellites, and they can give you a really accurate position um, down to a few centimeters nowadays. Um, we've got speed cameras. So speed cameras, um, I shall comment no more about those. <laughs> different people have different feelings about speed cameras, but they work by using um, usually some kind of uh, radar system. So they're sending out a radio, a radio wave, which is reflected off an oncoming vehicle. And the pulses of radio waves that are sent out, they're detected when they reflect back. And there will be a change in wavelength according to the speed of the oncoming vehicle. So if the oncoming vehicle is coming really fast, the wavelength is going to get a little bit compressed. And um, that's going to be able to be measured within the speed camera. And if, the, if that means you're, the vehicle is going too fast, it triggers a flash, takes a picture of the driver going no, like that, uh, behind the wheel. Um, so that's using the, both of these are using the Doppler effect to work. The, by the way, the detail about the Doppler effect here, um, not part of um, the detail you need to know for this particular unit, but I think it's useful to discuss it. It comes in other parts of the GCSC. Um, the speed gun uh, is pretty much the same thing. So a speed gun, again, it's sending out a radio wave. It could be a laser, so it could be laser light. It sends out pulses of radio or laser light, and when they're reflected back, it measures the difference in wavelength between the emitted wave and the received wave, and um, that can be used to calculate the speed and trigger a pursuit by a traffic cop around the corner. Okay, so I think I've covered everything there that um, is relevant to those other ways of measuring speed. They, and, and these are all things that might come up in a contextual question. Um, you know, you don't need to know the ins and outs of how any of these four things work, but you, you shouldn't be surprised if an exam question comes up and mentions one, but they will give you all the information you need in the question to answer it. Let's move on and have a look at a few more example questions. So here we've got Ben observing a stream of bubbles rising in a glass of fizzy cola. Um, the bubbles are produced at a steady rate. So they're being produced at the bottom here at a steady rate. Um, explain how the evidence in the diagram shows that the bubbles are accelerating. Feel free to chip in in the chat, by the way, when I'm asking the questions. Um, because of the delay, it can make it tricky to, to be interactive in real time, but do, do try. Um, I will also give you the answer gradually as we go through. So um, the bubbles are further apart near the top. So if the, the time interval in between the bubbles creation is the same, so we need to state that again, the time interval between the bubbles is constant. And so therefore the bubbles near the top, they're traveling a bigger distance in a given time, so they must be going faster. So the bubbles near the top travel further in the same time. Therefore, they are faster. And there we go. So there's three points there, three or four points there. Um, and probably this would be a three or four mark question. It's not clear from this clip that we have here, but I would suggest that would be a three or four mark question. Let's have a look at another one. Um, so here we've got um, something about ants. We've got silver ants living in the Sahara Desert. Okay, If they're in the sunshine too long, they die. So they have to be able to move out of the sun very quickly. And Sarah wants to find out how quickly they can move. So she places a ruler on the ground. And when an ant starts to run along the edge of the ruler, she uses a video camera to record the ant's movement. And the diagram shows the first and the fifth frame of the video she recorded. How far does the ant move between frame one and frame five? OK, so this is for three marks. Um, so between frame one and frame five, um, the total distance here, if we take it from the back of the ant to the back of the ant here. Um, and if we read off very carefully, you would draw these lines with a ruler in an exam, have a clear ruler with you in an exam so you can easily use it. Um, I would say for part one that the answer is 11.7 centimetres. 
and it says give your answer in meters so that is equal to 0.117 meters there's our answer just read off by carefully using a ruler more carefully than i'm sketching here and then for part two um camera takes um one frame every four milliseconds calculate the speed well speed average speed is displacement or distance over time we know the displacement we've just worked it out it doesn't matter what number you'd picked for the first part of the question, even if you had got it wrong, use the same number here, you won't be penalised twice. So even if you've got an earlier number wrong in a question, you can still gain the marks later on. So 0 0.117, that's our displacement. And the time we need to calculate from the frame rate um, and the number of frames that were taken. So it's four milliseconds for every frame. So um, we've got one, two, three, four, five frames. So it's four times five, so it's 20 milliseconds, and that's 0 0.020 seconds, because there are a thousand milliseconds in one second, and this is 20. Okay, so 0 0.117 divided by 0 0.02, and we get a speed of the ant of 5.85 meters per second. Sounds about right. That's quite quick. You think back to our um, speeds, that's about the speed of someone cycling. When we were looking at that earlier, we, we said that was about six metres per second, didn't we? Let's move on now and look at measuring speed in terms of circular motion. So this is a higher level topic only. Um, an, an object that's changing direction, it, it could be moving at constant speed, but it's also changing its velocity because um, it's changing its direction. So an object that's changing direction is also changing velocity. In other words, it is accelerating because there is a net force acting on it, causing it to change direction. In the case of this object on the right-hand side, if it has a velocity there, V, uh, velocity here is V, Velocity here is V, going anti-clockwise, there we go, another velocity there, V. There must be a force acting towards the centre here in order to keep it changing direction. And if there's a net force acting on an object, then by definition it's accelerating. But its speed could be constant. It could be going around this path at constant speed. But because it's direction, you can see the direction of the vector is at 90 degrees difference each of the way, each of the places around the circle, we have to say it's accelerating. So an object traveling in a circle is changing velocity but staying at constant speed. Think of a car going round and round about. It's the friction between the tyres on the road keeping the car uh, going in a circle, and that's the central force, the centripetal force, that's keeping it going round in a circle. Hi there, Sam. Um, so just make sure I've covered everything there. Um, yeah, and another example of this would be the, the following. So we've got um, a planet there, the planet Earth. Um, planet Earth orbits the sun, and it does so because there is a force towards the sun due to gravitational forces. So planets, they are examples of natural circular motion or almost circular. We all know probably the planets move in slightly elliptical orbits, but we'll ignore that for now. Um, planets and also stars orbiting the center of a galaxy and moons as well. They are, they're all examples of um, circular motion where gravity is the force causing the acceleration, causing the constant change in direction. And we've got satellites, natural and otherwise. So the moon I've already mentioned, uh, but other satellites orbiting planets and moons elsewhere in our solar system that we've put there, perhaps. Um, other examples of circular motion. And I've given you an example of a car on a roundabout. Um, if you push it too hard, then you'll overcome the frictional forces between the tyres and the road and end up disappearing off at a tangent. It's not what you want to do on a roundabout. Um, so it's the force towards the centre given by the friction between the tyres and the road, which is enabling the car to go in a circular path. And then we've got a plane here where we've got lift going in a certain direction, weight acting down, and a certain component of lift up as well. But we have motion towards a circular path here. So this is a plane banking, and as it banks, it's travelling in a circular path because some of that lift is being directed towards the centre of a circle as it's banking around a corner. 
all examples of circular motion. So are we okay um, thinking about how an object moving in a circle could be moving at constant speed and yet also accelerating? The reason being that the magnitude you might state as being the same, but the direction is changing every instant in time because it's going in that circular path. So if you're happy with that idea, please give me a one or a two. Um, if anyone is super confused, please tell me and I'll go back and um, cover that again. Thank you, Lena. Um, that takes a while for everyone to catch up with what I'm saying. Um, but if, you, if you're not sure, just pop it in the chat and ask me a question about circular motion. Thank you, Zara. And I'll, I'll come back to you if, um, if you'd like me to. Right, let's have a look at another question. Uh, last one, this one. So a plane travels from town A to town B. Um, and the figure shows the route taken by the train and it's drawn to scale, it says. And we're given a scale one centimetre is five kilometres. There are places on the journey where the train accelerates without changing speed. Explain how this can happen. So where on this journey will the train be accelerating without changing speed? Think about the different sections of the journey. Some are straighter than others, aren't they? Some have got quite big bends in them. So how could you explain that this train is accelerating without changing speed? The first thing you would state for your two marks here, we've got to make two good points. First thing that you need to say is that the train is changing direction. So if the train is changing direction, then therefore its velocity is changing. Any change in velocity is an acceleration. So the speed might well be constant. This, the train might be moving at a constant speed all the way through this journey, more or less. But it's definitely accelerating, nevertheless, whenever it goes around a bend. So when it changes direction, we can say the train is changing direction, therefore, or so, therefore, so its velocity is changing, meaning it is accelerating. You cannot have a change in velocity without an acceleration, even if speed is constant. Okay, so we've been looking at these objectives. Um, understand the difference between speed and velocity. Speed is scalar, remember. Velocity is a vector quantity. So speed just has a bigness, speed just has a size, whereas velocity has a, a magnitude, a bigness, and it has a direction. We looked at typical speeds for someone walking, running, cycling, and then a speed of a car, a train, and an aircraft. And then we looked at some calculations measuring speed and velocity. And we also looked at methods as well, um, light gates, ticker tape, and so on. And then lastly, for the higher level papers, we looked at understanding how objects moving in a circle can have constant speed, but changing velocity. So you can be moving at constant speed, but accelerating if you're changing direction. And that applies to objects moving in a circle. So does anyone have any questions for me at this point um, that you'd like me to cover? We've got a couple of minutes for questions. So if anyone's um, not sure of anything I've said, um, please pop your question in the chat. Um, how do you calculate acceleration using ticker tape? Right, okay. So acceleration is equal to change in velocity divided by time. So, um, you would look at the velocity between two dots near the beginning. Let's draw a bit of ticker tape. Okay, let's give an example here. So let's say there's um, 50 milliseconds in between each printing. Um, that because it's sorry, 50 milliseconds is that right? No, I'm going to say a fiftieth of a second. 50 hertz, one fiftieth of a second in between each one. So we measure that distance. Um, so we get our distance s. Um, we do S divided by uh, 1 50th, and that gives us our start speed. I'll call it S1. So that's our start velocity. And then at the end of the motion of the object, we'll take the gap between the last two dots here. Ignore that little mess there. And the last two dots here, this again is um, 1 50th of a second. Um, and this distance here, we're going to call that S2. So um, that's going to be S2 over 1 over 50, and that's our end speed. 
So start speed is u, end speed is v, final velocity. So we can then look at the total time. That's going to be one, two, three, four, four fiftieths of a second. So the acceleration is going to be final velocity s2 minus initial velocity s1 divided by four fiftieths of a second. That's a very quick explanation there, but that's one way you can do it. Um, you can take one interval and you take the end interval and then you can work out the acceleration of the object, um, knowing the time is the same between each printed dot. So I hope that helps. Um, please go back and review that if I was a bit quick. Uh, any other questions there for anyone else? Okay, just a quick chat then about what's coming up next. So the upcoming web classes, you can set um, reminders on YouTube for these. Um, so we have uh, on the 7th here, we've got four, sorry, 4th of July. Um, these are American date formats. So on the 4th of uh, July, we've got uh, GCSE chemistry on crude oil. Um, and then on the 11th of July, um, no worries, Mohammed, no worries at all. On the 11th of July, we've got a uh, maths web class, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, the chemistry is at 4 p.m. And then on the 18th of July, we've got another physics web class um, on density and states of matter. And on the 25th of July, a biology web class on diffusion in living organisms. Um, so you can set a reminder for those and uh, you can look up the schedule online. And that's just popped up in our chat. And so you can click on that link and you can uh, save that link on your browser and pop back to it and uh, remind yourself to, to be there. So just a reminder, um, for physics tutoring and all of the other topics we, we provide, you're going to get four plus classes a week. Um, we cover the full curriculum. Um, all the handouts you see we use are high quality and you have access to them throughout your membership and also the access to the library of past recordings and one-to-one -one support. So again, if you had any further questions today, if you were to sign up, you can email in to SnapRevise and ask for us to include um, exam questions on particular topics that you want in our next drop-in session. Um, and we will do that. So you get one-to-one -one support as, um, as well as the drop-in sessions, you'll get one-to-one -one support within the, the web classes too, um, to, a, to a great extent. What's a ticker tape? <laughs> Go back through the video you'll see it you'll see the description um so it's time to um almost time to, to stop now for today um just a final reminder there's the code there uh, enter tutor trial seven when you sign up on snapprovised.co.uk you will get seven days free access try it out go to as many sessions sessions as you can encourage your friends to go along as well again if you've got friends who have the same needs as you and the same subjects then you can make it more fun by getting them to come along too and um, I hope that's been helpful and um, have a nice evening and uh, a lovely week. Thanks very much.